Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of the Harlem Renaissance, and in this, our final installment, we will look at the artists of the Harlem Renaissance. And just as the jazz musicians gave the era its soundtrack and the writers gave it its language, the artists give us a historical record, not just of the art and the style of the time, but an actual visual record of the period itself. Just as white artists of that era were pushing boundaries, the black artists of the Harlem Renaissance were professionally trained, highly skilled, and pushed the boundaries of modern art in that era. One example of this is Aaron Douglas, who is sometimes also known as the father of African American art. His art portrayed black Americans in a new light and a new way, often moving through history, looking with pride upon each other, upon landscapes, and up to the heavens. He also employed new methods that combined graphic arts with traditional arts, and also borrowed from the modern artists of the day, uh, such as the Cubists and others. And as is typical of many artists of the Harlem Renaissance, he deployed bold colors, which we'll talk more about with some of the other artists. Finally, like many others, he looked to Africa for inspiration for his art, often drawing links between African Americans and their roots in the African motherland. Part of this might be attributed, as I've mentioned in an earlier lecture, to the growing fascination with Egypt, which was fueled by the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922, which I mentioned briefly as one of the big headline stories of the decade. Another of the prominent artists of the Harlem Renaissance was William H. Johnson, who may be particularly near to our hearts because of his roots in Florence, South Carolina, where he was born in 1901. And in fact, the Florence Museum holds a small collection of some of his works. In a prolific career, he produced thousands of different works, but many of them have been lost over time for reasons I'm going to describe momentarily. Ultimately, he embarked, like so many, as part of the Great Migration from South Carolina to New York at age 17. And a budding career in art took him to Europe and France, where he learned with some of the masters and became a master of his craft. He ultimately returned to the United States in the 1930s, where for a period of time, in the late 30s and early 40s, he became a prominent black artist of note. Now, I mentioned that he trained with many of the masters, and when you look at his art, it may appear very primitive and simple. But believe me when I say, all of that is intentionally done. If, in fact, you are able to go to the Florence Museum and look at some of his collection. Early in his career, he painted many still-life portraits of things like bowls of fruit, which look almost like they were a photograph. He was perfectly capable of painting absolutely realistic things, and so the styles you see in the paintings here are done intentionally. Beyond that, he also frequently used the materials that were common to people living in the South at that time for his art. In other words, he sometimes painted on burlap sacks or corrugated wood or material that goes into a tin roof or cardboard, which again is why many of his works are now lost because they simply deteriorated over time. So when you look at the figures in these pictures, and particularly think about the, the colors involved, imagine that some of them are painted on things like cardboard or tin, or on a burlap sack, where it's really difficult to draw anything that is uh, overly realistic. And in fact, if you were to be close to some of these paintings, or perhaps even run your fingers over them, he often layered uh, thick layers of paint, and other materials on top of the canvas. So these were novel methods which give his work a very bracing uh, visual impact and effect. He typically deployed the bright colors that you see in these paintings. <music> 
Tragically, William H. Johnson is perhaps not as well known as he otherwise would have been. After the death of his wife in 1944, his mental state declined, and ultimately he spent the last 23 years of his life in a state hospital in New York. And many of the paintings of his estate had to be sold to ensure his care. And many of them, as I mentioned, were lost over time. So while he might otherwise be considered one of the great masters of his era, uh, he remains, to this point, relatively obscure compared to some of the other artists. Another of the important artists of this era was Lois Mayu Jones. You see some of her works on the screen. Jones was born in Boston, and that was where she raised and achieved her initial training. But she actually experienced quite a bit of racism uh, and prejudice within the field of the arts. And at one point, she was told to move south where her people were, quote unquote, to launch her career in the arts. And she found that in the United States, she had trouble getting her works uh, put up in galleries and shows. And so ultimately, she traveled widely to New York and spent a lot of time in Europe, as many of the artists of this era did. Um, she had much greater success showing her work in Paris, Italy, and elsewhere than she did in the United States. And one of her most famous paintings, The Ascent of Ethiopia, which you see on the screen, again depicts the rise of African Americans throughout history to the achievements of the Harlem Renaissance era, depicted at the top there in music, drama, and art. And a final artist of note in this period is Palmer Hayden. Hayden was born in Virginia in 1890. And while he took an interest in art as a child, he really didn't achieve any formal training until he enlisted during World War I, when he took a drawing correspondence course. This led to a promising career in the arts. And after uh, his discharge from the military, he studied and worked at the Booth Bay Art Colony in Maine in the 1920s, and then by the late 1920s went on, as so many others, to Paris and Europe, where he began to distinguish himself. As so many others, we see in his paintings an emphasis on African folklore, but also on the common day-to-day -day life of African Americans in New York City and during the years of the Harlem Renaissance. And so in some ways, Palmer Hayden is the artist of the Harlem Renaissance because his scenes are so often associated with it, used in textbooks, used in things like my PowerPoint as the title slide. One of his most famous paintings is the one in the top right on this screen, The Janitor Who Paints, whom some have interpreted as a self-portrait because he himself worked a number of odd jobs while also scrapping out a career as an artist. But Hayden himself always said that it was a depiction of one of his friends and influences an older artist named Cloyd Boykin, who actually was called the janitor by many of his associates because he worked as a janitor while also being a painter. By the 1930s, with the onset of the Great Depression, some of the creative energy was sapped from the Harlem Renaissance. Although, as I mentioned, a number of the writers and artists continued to produce through the 30s and beyond. Even as the Harlem Renaissance began to fade, it had a significant and lasting legacy. First, it provided opportunities for artistic expression that had been largely denied to black Americans up to that point. Second, it left a vast collection of staggering artistic works, from the songs and recordings of Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith, to the written work of Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, to the artwork of William H. Johnson and Palmer Hayden. Work that students, scholars, and Americans of all sorts continue to study and admire today. Third, it showed all Americans that black artists are just as capable of producing extraordinary work as anyone else. In some cases, that knowledge opened doors for some black artists, writers, and photographers in the various New Deal programs like the Federal Artist Project. Fourth, the Harlem Renaissance laid a foundation for future artists to build upon. 
1937, artists in Harlem created the Harlem Community Arts Center, which provided support and training for aspiring artists for decades to come. And most importantly, the Harlem Renaissance instilled a mindset of black pride, achievement, upward mobility, and equality that was a key ingredient in setting the stage for the continued civil rights struggle. Without this genuine belief in their own self-worth and equality, blacks would not have been able to launch and endure the long, painful struggles of the civil rights movement. Writers such as Elaine Locke and activists like Marcus Garvey had a direct influence on black intellectuals and leaders like Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, the president of Morehouse College, who went on to become the teacher and mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King. This established a lineage of thinking that renders real truth to the thought that Martin Luther King and others stood on the shoulders of giants. The artists of the Harlem Renaissance helped to create the intellectual atmosphere that made the civil rights movement possible.